Hello and welcome on the Watchers TV and it has been a while that we haven't uh, done one of those uh, content that I know you guys appreciate in our Don't Do This At Home series as we're about to deconstruct a very original pocket watch so that we're not talking modern watches this time with our good friend uh, Mr. Peter Speak and we do so with some very fancy tools, a very fancy uh, workbench that we have here at the Watchers Club. One day we will uh, do a full demonstration of this uh, workbench because it's really amazing. We just love it. Anyhow, let's meet uh, Peter and uh, he's going to be standing just there. Let him deconstruct things for us. Today we're looking at a, uh, a Vacheron Constantin World Time Pocket Watch, which was made in 1949. So today that makes this watch 71 years old. Um, the case is made in 18 karat yellow gold. It has 41 different places, cities around the world, which are then shown on the outer dial. The manner by which the, the watch actually works is you have the association with the minute and hour hands in the center. As I move the hands around, you can see the 24-hour disc around the central dial turning. That disc turns once every 24 hours, so you have two rotations, of the central dial are equivalent to one rotation of that 24-hour indication dial. Assuming that we are now stopping at 4 o'clock in Switzerland, the, the time which is then found in any of these places around the, the outer dial is associated by the the hour that is aligned with that city or that place. The, the fact that this has, actually has 41 cities uh, marked around it is one of the most complete. Quite often world times don't necessarily have as many indications, as many cities around the world as you do find on this particular one. It is very simple to read. You just associate the, the place with that disk and you have your time. On that disk so that you know whether you are in uh, day or night. You have half of the disc is, uh, is light colored and the other half is darker. Now, this is a fairly uh, mature watch with 71 years of age and the dial is completely original. So you can see it is fairly tarnished. Um, however, it is original. So it does count. It does mean that this watch is actually, it's had a a, it's been respected, it's been cared. And the, in modern watch making today, all cases are water resistant, whereas this one never was. Okay, so the case back is, uh, is snapped in place. And the way that it's removed is that there is normally a section in the case back. And on this one, as usual, it's just to the right of the, of the pendant. There is a slight, a slight opening just here and that is designed like that so the case knife enters in between the case back and the center and then just very gently moving around a little bit and then the pop means that the case back is now loose. As, as simple as that is the, the goal of what we're doing here today is to be able to give everybody an insight into some wonderful horology. But I've been doing this for about 35 years. So please, when you have any kind of pocket watch of any kind of value, please leave it to watchmakers to actually to do what I'm doing. Because if you make one mistake, you can either damage the case or you can slip and you can actually then scratch the inside of the watch. The first view, of the inside of this 1949 Vacheron World Time pocket watch. You have the case back, and on the inside of the case back, you have the reference of the particular watch, which then associates to the, the Vacheron archives. You have the carrot, the hallmarks, everything which then validates that this watch is an original and an authentic Vacheron. You have the, the, the balance, 
the ratchet wheel for the barrel, you have the going train, and then you have the escapement, which then transfers power from the train through to the escapement and drives the, the balance backwards and forwards. It's been around for 71, year, 71 years. The actual watch is in really good condition. It's accurate, it functions, it works near to what it would have done when it was first made. The bridges are in good condition. There are a few little micro rays, scratches floating around. All of the steel work remains polished. It is in general in pretty good condition. Normally, whenever you are touching pieces, you never actually use, you never touch them with your fingers. Okay, this watch has to be dismantled, cleaned, and then reassembled. So I take the liberty of using my right hand, at least for the, the touching of the, the outside of the case, which can't be tarnished. One of the best tools to be able to actually hold a movement is the case that it actually is born in. The first thing that we're going to do to be able to dismantle the watch is we're going to let the power down. We move the click, which is here, which will allow the ratchet wheel here to unwind, which will in turn allow the mainspring to unwind, which is in the barrel underneath, and then the balance will stop oscillating. So you have all of the steel work, which is either circular grained or, or polished. The bridges are all made from German silver. So next I'm going to take off the, the bezel, which is held in place in the same way as the case back. It's clipped on. And again, there is just a slight recess between the, the bezel and the center of the watch. And now you can see the, the dial free of the glass and the, and the bezel. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the hands. With any, uh, any vintage pieces, we don't have the luxury of replacing any components. And part of the value of the watches is in their originality. So, one of the most delicate elements with this particular watch is, being, is taking enormous care not to actually touch and damage the dial. Because if you do, even if one was available, which it's not, it would then cease to be original. So the really one of the most um, awkward or the most difficult parts is actually what is conventionally quite simple, which is literally taking off the hands and the dials. The reason for the, for the plastic um, because I have to put a small amount of pressure on the central dial is to protect the dial and also to make sure that when the hands come off, which are friction fitted, they, they don't fly off. The two small hands are made in 18 karat gold. You now have the watch for the bezel, the glass, and the, and the two hands, as you see here. Now, because I don't have a really the original, I don't have a, a tailor-made movement holder for it, I'm still gonna leave the movement and the dial in the case whilst I remove the dial. Normally, or quite often, you would take the movement out and then remove the dial afterwards. The dial here is kind of like a cup, and the way it's held in place is there's a skirt that runs around the outside of it, and that literally 
pops on to the outside diameter of the, of the movement. On the dial, the position of all of the, the cities and the places is in association to the, the, different, the different time zones. If I turn it gently over, you can see the underneath of the dial and this little skirt which is there to hold the, the dial in place. The, the, the primary element that makes this watch uh, special or its complication is that world time indication. And that particular element is all hidden underneath this central dial. Because the dial is banging in the center and the movement is actually very slim, there was no space anywhere around the dial, around the movement, to be able to fix it like that. So the way that this particular dial is held in place is by friction. And this is also quite a challenging little maneuver because the only way to remove it is with a, a, a lever, highly polished, and very fine at the edges, which then has to find its way underneath and in, underneath the dial and between sorry between the dial and that disc. With this watch, this is actually the most delicate part. Because if I touch the bottom, it can't really be repaired. Again, because of the authenticity or the value is actually found in its originality. The dial is removed and you can now see where it's sitting. And the underside of that dial, there is a large boss or a large ring which is here. And it's that ring, that diameter, which is then pushed in to that inner section, into the inside of that large ring. On the inside of that ring, here, the brass wheel that you see there, that is, the, that is the hour wheel. That's the wheel upon which the hour hand is then pushed. And the small steel pivot above it, that's the cannon pinion, and that's where the minute hand sits. So, now just to set, to put it into setting, into setting mode. So now you can see the hour wheel turning clockwise, clockwise, and the actual disc turns anti-clockwise. So the hour wheel turns once every 12 hours, and the outer disc, which is turning around anti-clockwise, turns once every 24 hours. And as simple as it is, it's really quite brilliant, because just by that one little function, you have a world time timepiece. The actual mechanism, that disc, which is now hiding the pinion which is actually driving it, is held in place just by two screws.
Okay. So again, you have the hour wheel, which I can now remove. And that pinion there, which is linked to the minute wheel, which is here, and that top pinion is what then drives the hour wheel, that pinion is what in turn drives this very large pinion, which is on the underside of that disc. And then you can see, normally it's the other way around, it's the, the disc that moves and this central section, which is then fixed to the movement. The disc is made in brass, it is then, uh, afterwards it would have been rhodium plated. That, in essence, is the, is the complication of the watch. That's the unique element of it, which differ, differentiates it from other simple timepieces. So now we take off that pinion. That then drives the piece. And the next step is to actually remove the movement from the, from the case. Some little, little features about the watch. Um, the actual... The actual movement is very slim. The overall watch is very slim. It's under nine millimeters in, in thickness, and that's including the, the, the glasses that, that are on it. So to be able to get, to maintain the, the thickness or the thinness of the caliber, there are certain things about it which are actually quite nice, such as, and we'll see it in a little bit, the actual barrel is called a captive barrel. So the barrel is, is held in place but by the ratchet wheel, which screws onto the arbor, the piece that runs through the barrel, and then sandwiching the, the barrel bridge. The barrel bridge is the large bridge, which is here. So when you turn the watch over, and you look from the other side, you have the barrel cap of the barrel actually visible. There's no additional bridge, or there's no pivoting, um, the, the, barrel arbor, the barrel arbor here isn't pivoting inside uh, a, second, uh, a second bearing. One of the nice things about the watch is that the dial is original. Every element, every component within the watch appears to be original. The only thing which may have been changed, which has been changed at one point, is the winding crown. Because after 71 years, uh, or even less of, of use, the winding crowns would tend to wear out because they get the maximum amount of, of wear. So the crown would have been replaced at some point, but it would be, the original one would have been very similar to this one. The actual mainspring within the watch, which you can just see through this little window, which is here. Normally, with all mainsprings, modern or old to a degree, they have a, a lifespan, they don't last forever. And early mainsprings were made from carbon steel. And they would, at a given moment in time, they would break, they would crack. And with this particular example, it appears to have an original mainspring still inside of it. And the only reason I know that is that it's blued steel. And you can see that through this little cutout here in the, in the barrel cab. Um, all modern mainsprings are, uh, or I say 99%, because there's always exceptions, uh, are new alloys, more efficient, more uh, deliver a more constant uh, amount of power through the train of the watch, um, but they're always white or steel colored. So this is most likely an original one. Another little element when it comes to looking at the barrel, you have a little nick in the side of the, the case here, and the little nick, which is on the outside of the barrel, forming like a small V shape, then follows the V form, which is in the barrel cap, which ensures that the barrel cap is actually put in exactly the same place every time that the barrel is actually dismantled and reassembled. The, the next thing to do is to remove the, the stem, the winding crown and stem, the two pieces together. The stem is held in place by this setting lever, this piece here. And to loosen that setting lever, we turn the watch over and there is a screw here which holds it in place. And very gently, just by a small amount, we loosen that screw, not removing it all the way or not undoing it all the way. 
and then we pull out the stem. Now the stem we're going to put back into the watch once the movement is outside of the case. Then you have two screws which fix the movement inside of the case. One is here and the other one is on the other side. Now you have the movement free of the case. By putting the stem back in, all of the setting mechanism or the, the pinions, the winding pinion and the sliding clutch, which are shown here moving, will then stay in place. So we don't need to take all those pieces out. This is a fairly generic, commonly used movement holder used by every watchmaker when they don't have the, a specific movement holder to actually hold the movement all the way around, often used in, uh, in restoration and repair work. The first thing that we always do is to remove the, uh, the balance because it's the most delicate part within the watch. There is a little cutout under the, the balance cock. So this is the balance wheel. It is held in place by the balance cock. And there is a little, little cutout just on, just at the end here. And that allows you to put, it's a little piece of wood, which is shaped like a screwdriver, which allows us to go underneath and then lever it without actually damaging or scratching anything. In the same way that we use the wood, we use tweezers, which are ideally a, a softer material than the bridges so that we reduce any likelihood of the, of the tweezer, of the tool, scratching the, the bridge. And there you have the balance and the balance cock removed. The most delicate part, the balance, is now removed from the watch and now we can see we can see the escapement. We can see the Swiss lever escapement, which is held in place by a very small uh, mirror finished steel um, pallet cock, which you see here. That's the next thing that we remove. The, um, the actual lever, the Swiss lever, or the Swiss anchor, which you have here, that's one of the most complex parts of the whole of the watch, along with the, the balance. It's made from hardened steel. All of the, the angling that is on it would have been done by hand. And one of the nice elements about it 
is the the jewels, the palette jewels which are in it, are flush all the way in to the into their recesses, into their homes where they live. There's no adjustment on them. Normally, in the majority of modern calibers that are made, uh, and even calibers made at the same time as this, there was always a little bit of space so that there was adjustment. And then there was a material called shellac, which was underneath it, which was a kind of a form of glue, but it was heat sensitive, that would then block them in place. With this one, there's no adjustment. So they were, it was actually made in such a way that it was kind of like perfect. The, the, the ends of the, uh, the surfaces would have been, the acting surfaces would have been uh, machined, they would have been lapped so that there was no adjustment required afterwards. Another thing which is difficult to see at this scale, but the surfaces, the visible surfaces are slightly domed, whereas most modern uh, equivalents are, are always flat. As technically, it changes nothing, but aesthetically, it's a nice little feature. And now the train is effectively loose. Another little, little detail, which is nice, which you would see on slim pocket watches, is this screw. So you have the main screws which hold down the, the bridges, which are here. But then you have this, what appears to be almost like a redundant screw here, which is higher than all of the other screws put together. Now, from what I understand, the reason for that screw was a form of security, because the case backs, as you have here, to keep the watch slim is pretty thin and it's quite a large surface so it can actually risk effectively uh, buckling, not buckling, it could, uh, it could give a little bit. And if that gives and it touches the actual movement, there would be a risk that it would actually damage something within the movement. So that screw is in one of the st most the strongest parts of the movement. It's not over a wheel but it's right over, uh, it's over a solid part of that bridge sitting on top of the main plate. So if the case back was to give a little bit, it would then butt, it would then push against that screw and then nothing would be damaged, there'd be no stoppages and the watch would continue to function fine. So if, you t if, it, if I unscrew it, there's nothing underneath it, it's not holding anything in place. Its purpose is just to be able to protect the movement against any possible uh, pressure applied onto the case bank. The next part I'm going to take off is the is the escape rule bridge. So the escape rule bridge, sorry, the escape rule cock. A, a bridge normally is a, a piece which traverses wheels and is held on two sides by screws. A cock is normally the name of uh, a piece which then holds in a wheel but is only supported on one side. So the, the escape wheel cock which is here, it has a steel end piece with a, uh, a jewel in the top. The same system as you find in the, in the actual balance wheel. And the watch is quite old and at this point with pocket watches there, were no, there was no shock protection so all of these pieces are fixed. And then once the escape wheel cock is removed, we can then remove the escape wheel, which is the last wheel in the train, which is made from steel. Next stage is the, the main train bridge.
And then once the train bridge is removed, you see the you see the center, third wheel, and fourth wheel. Fourth wheel then drives the escape wheel. A nice feature or a nice element of these early pocket watches is how the actual jewels were held in place. Unlike 99% of modern jewels, which are actually a push fit so that they can then be adjusted and they can be moved up and down slightly inside of their, their bridges, these can't be adjusted. The jewels are placed inside of a, of a cutout so that it would actually effectively rivet each jewel in its own place. So there's no adjustment, it has to be made perfectly, it has to be made correctly to the correct tolerance. This one in particular, the center, the central jewel here is rather nice because it's incredibly, it's domed, it's very rich in its color. Um, it doesn't have to be that nice in a sense. It can work effectively, functionally, without that kind of detail. But when the piece was made, they went that far. Again, the bridges are made from German silver. You have a very delicate um, circular finish, which you can see here. And again, all of the angling, the juncture between the flanks of the watches and the surface, they're all angled. As with all sort of high-end watchmaking, uh, or what we call high-end watchmaking, is there's time would have been spent by uh, decorators, more likely than watchmakers, but also watchmakers, um, in that actual process of finishing that component. So somebody would have held this piece as with the other pieces inside of a jig and then spent time removing material, polishing the angles, making sure that everything was beautiful. And that is what, again, and I've said it before, but this is one of the things that differentiates micromechanics from horology because so much about watchmaking is not only function, but it's the aesthetics, it's the beauty that you actually find within the different components and the final assembly of the watch. The numbers and the, or rather the letters, the words that you find here, the, the branding, the 18 jewels, Geneva, the Swiss, the adjustments, uh, the, the eight adjustments that you see engraved into this piece, they're all yellow. So this piece, when it was finished, would have been flashed with a, a gold, uh, like a, a gold plating. And then all of the surface would have been removed, leaving only the lower sections in gold, so that you get that contrast. Very simple, but very effective. Still made to, like that today. And then we come back to the movement. And then we have the, the train here. So, I'm going to remove some of the wheels, but not all. If I turn the winding crown, it turns this wheel, which is the upper crown wheel, which in turn turns the, the ratchet wheel, and then this is the click, which when the watch is assembled, then allows the ratchet wheel to turn in one direction and then blocks it from unwinding going in the other direction. The center wheel the center wheel, which you have here, then traverses the watch. There's a cannon pinion on the other side. That is the, the clutch mechanism for the uh, setting mechanism upon which the, the minute hand then sits. I'll turn the watch over. And then you can see, again, the barrel is turning around here. You have Okay, a really very, very simple uh, setting and winding mechanism, which is here. And again, this you tended to find quite a lot in a lot of early uh, pocket watches and very early wrist watches from the beginning of the last century. You have the setting lever, which is this. So when you pull on the stem, that lever moves up. It pushes down this setting lever and the spring to the side, it locks it in place. So there's just effectively three pieces. They're strong, it's simple, it's functional, and it works. And you have quite a long sliding clutch, which is here, which then goes from winding up the watch through the winding pinion at the top, 
The sliding clutch meshes with a little pinion here, and then there's a second pinion which will then drive this minute wheel, the minute wheel which then meshes with a cannon pinion, and then upon the cannon pinion is what you have the minute hand. Okay, you push the stem back in place, the setting lever then falls down, the sliding clutch then moves back up, and then you find yourself back into winding mode, so to speak. In a conventional uh, servicing, the next stage would be to actually remove the cannon pinion. So again, this is the cannon pinion. This piece is the cannon pinion. And that piece there is a push fit which goes onto the center wheel, onto the center wheel pinion. Now, the way that is removed is you pull it off. Now, I'm not actually going to do that because this piece is 71 years old and I don't want to do anything which risks damaging the, uh, the watch. Um, and although I don't think there's it, anything would happen to break it, I don't want to take the risk. So I'm going to leave it in place. Now that also means that if you don't take off the cannon pinion, you cannot actually remove this whole bridge uh, in a complete form. I'm going to continue and I'm going to remove the, the screws holding the ratchet wheel in place, which will then allow the ratchet wheel to be removed, and then I can take off the barrel bridge. Okay, so that is the ratchet wheel, and then the, the barrel, the, this is the barrel, this is the barrel lava, and this is the barrel bridge. The ratchet wheel, which is this piece, fits on the top. That's the piece I've just removed, held in place by the three screws. When those three screws go through, it then sandwiches the barrel bridge between the arbor and the ratchet wheel. And that's how it's held in place. And that is one of the things which allows the watch to be as thin as it is, because the barrel is effectively traversing the thickness of the, of the watch, with the exception of the, the thickness of the, the, the barrel bridge. And now the last thing I'm going to do is remove the barrel bridge. So you have the barrel bridge. So here, for example, you have spotting. Now all of this is invisible. You don't see any of it, but it's still present. And now we can remove the barrel. 
So the barrel is kind of the heart of the watch. That's what's pumping energy, pumping blood through it. It's the barrel that has the mainspring inside of it, and it's the mainspring that you wind up manually, which then causes the, the watch to tick by, by propelling force through the, the going train. So, with the exception to part of the winding mechanism and setting mechanism, the center wheel and the cannon pinion, the watch is now dismantled. One last thing. When the watchmakers were making the pieces, they may have been making two or three of these at the time. The adjustments were made manually so you couldn't necessarily take a bridge from one piece and put it into another one. So there had to be a way to be able to differentiate one watch from another, one movement from another. So the way they did that was that all of the bridges had their own identification. So if I go to the barrel bridge, and turn it over, You have a little recess section which is here and it's printed or rather stamped 800. This is the center bridge. It's the same thing. 800 has been stamped into it. The escape wheel bridge underneath it again 800. And harder to see because the balance is still in place. But underneath the balance in the bridge is again stamped 800. So when the watchmaker would have finished all the pieces, he could have then cleaned them, uh, simultaneously assembled them with, with other pieces at the same time. Um, but the pieces would never have been mixed up. In a conventional uh, restoration or repair, the watch would be completely dismantled, which I haven't done. You would have to dismantle the cannon pinion with the center wheel, the setting mechanism, remove the balance from the, the balance cock, and there's a number of other components, including the barrel, which would then be uh, dismantled to be properly cleaned if the thing was going to be done properly. Now, this, as I said, this is not an explanation on, on how to, uh, to, to repair. The goal of what we're doing here today is to be able to give you an insight into watchmaking, an insight into the beauty of, of, of horology. And as an example of a, a world time piece by, made by one of the Trinity, one of the most famous watchmaking houses in, in Switzerland, this is a really beautiful example. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. It's always so interesting and fascinating to discover the intricacy of these mechanisms from the inside. And if you want to know more, I mean, I clearly invite you uh, to check out uh, Peter's website, The Naked Watchmaker. You'll have plenty of good stuff over there to be uh, seen and found and learned. So we'll be doing another few of these videos in the near future. Always a pleasure to do. And uh, till then, well, remember, just don't do this at home and viva watchmaking! Thank you.